Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Today is a joint webinar co-organized by AGU, Geohealth Section and Global Environmental Change Section. I'm Yuhan Rao, a member of Global Environmental Change Section Executive Committee. The rapid change environments has posed significant impact on public health, from air pollution to the current pandemic. The need to, of extensive collaboration between earth science with public health research is urgent. And we are really lucky to have this joint webinar co-organized between the GeoHealth section and the GEC section. I would like to thank uh, Antonio from AGU who supported our webinar today and also thanks uh, Jennifer Stowell and Daniel Tong from GeoHealth section to make this happen. Thank you, Johan. Um, yes, uh, we will uh, have the webinar recorded and the uh, recording will be available via the AGU uh, YouTube channel. Please submit your question via the question box and we will answer your questions at the end of today's webinar. And I would like to hand it over to Daniel Tong, the meeting co-chair from Geo Health section to introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Johan. It's our great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Jeffrey Shaman. Jeff is a professor in the Department of Environment Health Sciences and also the director of the Climate and Health Program at the Columbia University School <laughs> of Public Health. His research focuses on the survival, transmission, and the ecology of infectious agents, uh, that including the impact of meteorology and hydrology on those processes. His recent research mostly focuses on mosquito borne and also respiratory pathogens. Without further ado, I will pass the mic to Jeff. Jeff, thanks again for accepting our invitation and sharing your research with our community. My pleasure, Daniel. Thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to speak with you all. Um, I'm gonna be talking a bit today about some of the research that has come out of my group, uh, looking at the transmission dynamics of influenza, uh, implications for SARS-CoV-2 as well. And in particular, uh, some of the methods that we brought to bear, looking at meteorological drivers, developing infant systems, and ultimately forecasting systems. So uh, I like to acknowledge my funders up front. They include all these listed here. If I don't do this now, I tend to forget. So there's a list of funders here, and also my collaborators. Uh, this work has had a lot of other people providing input into it. Uh, on the left are people who have been associated with my group at Columbia and Mailman and others who've also worked on this from various other institutions are listed on the right. So I'm gonna start by showing you a picture here. Uh, it looks a little bit like a smiley face. And what it is, is it's, a, it's the climatology of influenza in California and New York states. Uh, what it really shows you is something that all of us who've lived in those parts of the world, such as Northern Hemisphere and US, um, no, intuitively, and that's that you tend to get the flu during the winter time. What this is, is in fact an average daily uh, value of excess pneumonia and influenza mortality over a 31 pe year period from 1972 to 2002. And so what we see is a peak in influenza mortality or influenza related mortality in January, and then it drops off and bottoms out in the summer months and then comes back up as the fall progresses. This is something that we all experience with respect to flu and we understand it. And this excess pneumonia and influenza mortality is a good proxy for influenza activity, which is difficult to measure in its full form. Now, this seasonality has been observed for a very long time. It goes back 2,000, 2,500 years. The Greeks wrote about it. In fact, there were certain times of year where people were more prone to get these certain types of maladies that are consistent with a respiratory illness. Uh, if you were to look at the explanations for why this occurs though, I would say that we have some understanding of it with respect to flu, but it's still not as complete as it needs to be. The hypotheses that are used to try to explain why this manifests fall into three basic groupings. The first has to do with the fact that during the winter time, it's colder outside and people tend to spend more time indoors. That time indoors facilitates more person-to-person -person contacts, there's less ventilation of air, there's more opportunities for spread of the virus, and that in and of itself facilitates person-to-person -person transmission and results in the rise in flu during the colder months of the year and the peak that we see in excess pneumonia and influenza mortality during the winter time. 
A second group of hypotheses has to do with changes in our immune function. And this also is actually tied to the environment ultimately. And there, the idea is that during the winter time, the sun is at a lower angle in the sky, day length is shorter. And as a consequence of these changes that take place, there's less vitamin D and melatonin production, which may impair immune function. With an impaired immune system, people may be more susceptible to an infection. And furthermore, once infected, they may not amount and as effective as an effective a response to that um, malady. And as a consequence, in the case of influenza, you might run a higher viral titer, you might shed more of the virus back into the environment for a longer period of time, and thus you may be more contagious. So not only are you potentially more susceptible, you're potentially more contagious once infected. You couple of those things together and you get a phase locking where the peak of influenza activity occurs in the wintertime. The third group of hypotheses has to do with purely environmental conditions. And there it might have to do with things related to temperature or humidity or UV radiation that once the virus is expelled from a host during the process that I'll talk about in a moment, the virus is it more or less viable. And there, there may be conditions during the winter time that are more conducive for the viability of the virus that makes it more feasible for it to be transmitted from person to person, whereas in the summertime, the opposite is true and it's less possible. The viability of the virus is less and there's less transmissibility and hence you get the seasonality of influenza. Now, this gets to a point that's sort of a side point, but really critical when you get down to it, which is how is influenza transmitted? We refer to this as the modes of influenza transmission. And while we know how flu can be transmitted, and people will break it up depending on how they want to do it in two, three, or four categories. I have it in four here. Um, we know how it can be transmitted. We actually don't know how it is. We don't know what the dominant mode is or if there are more than one dominant modes or if some modes are dominant in some situations and others in others. We don't have an understanding of it. We do not observe the transmission process. And this is very critical for understanding how flu actually gets around and how other respiratory pathogens get around. You may have heard a lot about this in the context of COVID-19 and the reality is we don't know. Early when COVID-19 came out, I heard a lot of insistent by, insistence by a number of pundits and scientists that, well, it's droplet borne, it's all droplet. And I was just shaking my head going, oh, how do we know this? This is a novel virus, nobody's examined it. There's no way we can know this. So we don't know it for something as well studied as influenza. We're certainly not gonna know it for COVID-19. We have some issues that still remain to be resolved that are actually microphysical, but really critical for understanding what's going on. So let's go through this. Uh, the four modes, the first is direct contact. I am sick with the influenza. I will be shedding it in my oral and nasal mucosa. If I kiss my wife, for instance, I'm going to transmit that to her and she's gonna become sick with it. That is not thought to be a common mode of transmission because we don't go around kissing lots of people all the time, but that is direct contact. The second mode of transmission or pathway is indirect contact. And this is why they tell you to wash your hands. So if somebody is breathing or speaking or singing or coughing or sneezing, and that picture there shows a sneeze, they're going to be producing lots of droplets. We exhale them all the time just when we're tidal breathing. Some of those droplets will contain the virus if we're shedding influenza. And some of them will be large enough that they'll settle out onto objects. They'll settle on phones, they'll settle on our hands, they'll settle on tabletops, on utensils, on computers, on podiums. Then somebody else can come along and touch those things, get them on their hands, transfer it to doorknobs, but more importantly, transfer it to their mouth or nose or eyes if they were to rub their eyes or pick their nose or eat a cheeseburger, things of that nature that can bring the virus into the person's system so that it has access to actually complete the transmission process and set up a new infection in a new host. So this is why they tell you to wash your hands. The indirect objects onto which the virus settles, those are called fomites. By washing your hands, you can get rid of some of the transmission potential by washing away or degrading the virus that may have accumulated on your hands. The evidence that hand washing is actually effective at curtailing the transmission of respiratory viruses is kind of mixed, maybe even weak, um, but it's certainly possible that for these viruses, this is an important pathway some of the time or in some instances. The third mode of transmission is droplet. 
that has to do with the fact that you look at the sneeze shown in this picture here, and this person is projecting a cloud of droplets away. And if somebody is standing close enough, they can catch some of that directly on their eyes, nose, or mouth. And as a consequence, the infection can get set up. And it doesn't have to be something as innately gross as somebody sneezing directly in your face, yet it still can manifest because obviously there's a plume there and some of the material can get close enough to get uh, onto somebody and actually infect them. The last mode of transmission is airborne. And here the idea is that some of the stuff coming out of the person's mouth, in this case for the sneeze, is going to be fairly small. Some of it's gonna come out at a small enough radius that it is essentially aerosolized. Other components of it may be near that component, uh, near that level, and they may then evaporate down further in the subsaturated environment, and they become small enough to be aerosolized. They're actually kept aloft by the turbulence in the air at that point, and so they can float around for an extended period of time. The consequence of that is that somebody else can inhale it subsequently and set up an infection that way. Now, influenza was only identified in the 1930s. Prior to that, we actually didn't know what the infectious agent was. So when the 1918 flu outbreak was taking place, they actually didn't know what flu was. They hadn't found the virus yet. It was found subsequently. Uh, from the 30s onward, I think people thought that mostly airborne transmission was the dominant mode. At least they thought so till about the mid 70s. And then at that point, I think for flu, it flipped more to indirect. And then back in the 90s, it went back to aerosol. And now I think we're mostly confused about it, to be perfectly honest. We don't really have a firm resolution as to what is the dominant mode. And as I said, it may be that in certain situations, one mode is more important than the other. If you have kids around an elementary school cafeteria table in close proximity, sharing food and leaning over each other and doing what small children may do and not being that hygienic, there may be certain modes that are available there that are not available in a work setting comprised of adults who tend to keep better distance, don't share their food as much, and tend to be a little bit more hygienic. So having followed on this modes, I wanna tell you now about a guinea pig experiment that was run um, by some virologists at Mount Sinai in New York City. They had found that the guinea pig was an effective animal model for studying the transmission and some other aspects of influenza. And they had used it in a set of experiments to see how atmospheric conditions affected the transmissibility of the virus. What they did was follows. They set up a chamber that had four levels in it. And on each level, they put in individual cages a guinea pig, two on each level, two cages on each level. And one of the guinea pigs was infected with influenza and the other was exposed. So they had this on each level. They put it in an enclosed chamber with a slight airflow going from the infected towards the exposed, and they set it at fixed relative humidity and temperature conditions for 72 hours. At the end of the 72 hours, they did a number of things, but among them, they also counted up how many of the exposed guinea pigs, zero, one, two, three, or four, had actually become infected with influenza. In other words, had caught the flu while in the chamber for 72 hours. Uh, they did this experiment 20 times using different fixed temperature and relative humidity conditions. And what they found were some marginally statistically significant effects in which colder temperatures and lower relative humidity conditions seem to favor the transmission of the influenza virus. Now I should also add that the guinea pigs are in separate cages and guinea pigs do not sneeze or cough, which means that direct, indirect and droplet transmission are not going to happen. The only route of transmission in this instance happens to be airborne. So they did this experiment and I looked at this and I said to myself, well, why are they using relative humidity and temperature? And why are they adjusting the temperature and the relative humidity? If they're adjusting the temperature, they're monkeying with the relative humidity and they may not really understand that. I mean, they can set it and they fix it, but it is not a well-constrained variable. Why use this relative measure as opposed to one that is a measure of mass using mass or pressure for the, of the amount of water vapor in the air. And the equation on the right shows you what I'm trying to get at here. Relative humidity can be defined as equal to the vapor pressure, which is a measure of the partial pressure of the air due to water vapor, divided by the saturation vapor pressure, which is the vapor pressure at which the air would be equilibrium between condensation and evaporation. It's the point at which theoretically fog or a cloud would begin to form. So you divide E by E sub S, that saturation vapor pressure, that gives you a fraction between zero and one, you multiply it by 100%, and 
and that gives you the relative humidity. But the important thing to note here is that it's written for the saturation vapor pressure as E sub S of T. And that's because the saturation vapor pressure point varies strongly as a function of temperature. The consequence of this is that if you have a closed space, an enclosed space, and you want to change the relative humidity of that space, you have two options. One is you could run a humidifier or a dehumidifier, and that would change the numerator, the amount of water vapor in the air. Or you could go over, if it's a room, and play around with a the thermostat and change the temperature, which would change the denominator by adjusting the saturation vapor pressure of the environment. And that too would change the relative humidity. So my question was, well, why don't they look at a mass-based measure? Why not, not just look at temperature and relative humidity, but why don't you look at something that measures the absolute humidity? Just to put another point on this, this is not insignificant because saturation vapor pressure, E sub S, rises exponentially with increasing temperature. And this is shown on the right. That blue line there is the clausius clapeyron equation showing how saturation vapor pressure in millibars increases as temperature rises, here shown in degrees Celsius. And what the blue line shows is 100%, the saturation line. The green line is 50% relative humidity. And what we can see with those two Xs on there is that air with 50% relative humidity at 25 degrees Celsius has nearly four times as much water vapor as air with 50% relative humidity at five degrees Celsius. Now, those are very real world conditions. As you go from winter to summer, those are conditions that you would experience in a place like, let's say, New York City. So why not use a measure of absolute humidity? Now, this is not to discount the importance of relative humidity, which can be very biologically meaningful and important, but it might be sensible to look at both is what our rationale was. So what we did is we took the data that they had in their paper and we used the clausius clapeyron equation, which is the first equation here, and that equation for relative humidity to back out an estimate of the vapor pressure, which is a pressure-based measure of the amount of water vapor in the air for each of the 20 chamber experiments. We then redid their analysis, doing it as a regression for both relative humidity, temperature, as well as the new variable that we had calculated, vapor pressure. And what we found were moderately statistically significant effects consistent with what they found in the paper in which lower relative humidity conditions and colder temperatures favored the transmission of the virus, it says percent transmission, but it's not written as a percent. I apologize for that. And the same for relative humidity. But if you get down to the bottom where it shows vapor pressure, we get a much more statistically significant relationship. So this was interesting to see at first blush. Now, the authors from this study out of Mount Sinai put forth two hypotheses to explain why lower relative humidity conditions might be responsible for an increase in transmission among the guinea pigs. The first of these hypotheses was that virus-laden aerosols, which are called droplet nuclei, are more efficiently produced at lower humidity due to increased evaporation of expelled droplet particles, such that more virus remains airborne longer. What this means is that the guinea pig is chattering or breathing, and it's expelling these droplets, and they come out in a distribution of sizes. Some of them are gonna be very tiny and already aerosolized. Some of them are gonna be bigger and fall down in the cage. There are going to be some that are intermediate, that if the air in the chamber is dry enough that it supports enough evaporation to take place quickly enough, those droplets may also evaporate down to the point where they can be aerosolized, be able to float around the chamber and inhaled by the exposed guinea pig. So in a more subsaturated environment, in a drier environment, you may be producing conditions that are consistent or conducive for producing more aerosols uh, for the ex average expelled uh, droplets that come out of a, a guinea pig. So we decided to test this. We would say to ourselves, well, really, if you're going to get down to this, it's not just evaporation that's important, it's also the rate of sedimentation. And we could build a simple model, which is shown in the box there, that uses the terminal velocity for sedimentation and the rate of evaporation to build a simple model that describes what happens to droplets and how it varies as a function of different humidity and temperature conditions. So we took this model and we ran a suite of experiments. We did this for non-supersaturated conditions. If you look at the upper right plot there, we didn't do it in that upper white area that takes up much of the space there. We did it for that exponential line along the clausius clapeyron and everything below and to the right of that. And what you're seeing is as a function of temperature and vapor pressure, 
a heat map showing you the number of seconds it took for a droplet of pure water to fall to the ground from a height of one meter. And that droplet was 20 microns. Initially, we did it for some different size droplets. And what we saw was that as you moved to warmer and drier conditions, you were seeing that, in fact, it was taking um, more time for it to actually hit the ground. And by the time you got to the warmest and driest conditions where it goes white there, the droplet had gotten small enough down to two microns of size that we considered it aerosolized. So at that point, it essentially goes to infinity, we said, and we just put it, made it white again and put a DN there for droplet nuclei. What this shows you is that it's actually at warmer and drier conditions that the formation of droplet nuclei and the additional aerosolization of droplets that otherwise would have hit the ground takes place. This is not quite consistent with their empiric findings from that chamber experiment with the guinea pigs. Furthermore, if evaporation is really driving what is going on, and there's the equation for evaporation shown on the left, then what it's really should be proportional. The variables that are actually changing that should really be driving the evaporation of a droplet and determining whether it stays aloft is not relative humidity or temperature or absolute humidity. It's the vapor pressure deficit, E minus E sub S, divided by the temperature. So we took their same data of the guinea pig experiments and we, divide, we did a regression versus this vapor pressure deficit divided by temperature. And what we found was something that was not statistically significant. So we found that there was no empiric relationship there, unlike what we saw for absolute humidity. So all this seemed to discount the possibility that this first hypothesis really held together. However, they did have a second hypothesis. And the second hypothesis was that for some reason, influenza survival increases as humidity decreases such that airborne transmission remains viable longer at lower, relative, at lower humidity conditions. They said relative humidity. And here we're gonna look at it for both. Now, influenza is a virus and viruses are debatably alive. They're really just a, uh, a, a bit of nucleic acids, either RNA or DNA, in the case of flu, it's RNA, uh, with a protein capsule around it. In the case of flu, it also has a lipid layer around it further. There's not that much there, and they're not capable of reproducing themselves. As a matter of fact, they're really their sole aim is to go from one host to another, to get inside the cells of that host, to hijack its machinery there in its nucleus, and to use that machinery to make more copies of itself, which it then buds out you shed that out and somebody else then picks it up and you repeat the cycle. So it's actually not even doing the reproduction itself, it's using your body to do the reproduction. So the viability though is something that can happen because when you expel the droplet out of yourself as a sick person into the environment, it is subject to those environmental conditions. And they may produce conditions within that droplet that are less conducive for the virus not breaking down, for the RNA chelating for the phospholipid layer around it exploding, for something being activated prematurely, something that makes it so the virus breaks down or is no longer capable of functioning as it should. And as a consequence, it's no longer viable. It's no longer capable of setting up an infection. Now, there are many studies that have looked at influenza virus survival, and they've done so always looking at either relative humidity or temperature or both. There haven't been any studies that have looked at it in response to absolute humidity. Many of these studies have looked on surfaces and a number of them have actually looked at it airborne. And that green drum-like thing that you're seeing in the lower left is in fact what's called a Goldberg drum, which is an apparatus where you atomize virus that you've cultured into it, you keep it rotating at fixed conditions, and then you can sample the air in there and determine how much of the virus stayed viable over time and how much broke down or degraded. So we went combing through the literature and we looked around for studies that had actually done an analysis of both temperature and humidity, and it actually printed the data in their paper. Some of these studies go back to the 1940s, but the one that actually had looked at both relative humidity and temperature and actually had the data in their paper was this 1961 study of Harper. And they'd done it atomized in a Goldberg drum, and they pulled out various time points, the survival or how much of the virus had remained viable. And you can see here that we're looking at one hour, six hour, and 23 hour, viability of virus is a percentage of the original amount that was viable. And um, that is shown in red, green, and blue, respectively. We've taken those data and we've rerun a similar regression analysis 
first just plotting it on the left. And you can see that as the relative humidity conditions get drier, more of the virus seems to be viable. Similarly for temperature, as it gets colder, as you move to the left, more of the virus stays viable. And then when you plot it up versus vapor pressure, which we calculated back out of it, as we did in the previous study, we see that it actually lines up very nicely on an exponential. As a matter of fact, if you do a simple log linear regression of the one hour viability of virus as a function of vapor pressure, 90% of the variance is explained by this single measure. So that seemed very compelling evidence. Furthermore, if we look at the seasonality of influenza, it peaks in the winter time in the Northern hemisphere once you get out of the tropics. And what that relationship presented was that if drier absolute humidity conditions, the virus should be more viable and more transmissible among guinea pigs. And since we know flu peaks in the winter time, we would expect that that would require that flu, excuse me, that absolute humidity be minimal in the winter time when flu is most abundant. And indeed that is the case. In fact, both indoors and outdoors, the blue lines are showing you indoor and outdoor climatologies of absolute humidity, in this case, vapor pressure conditions. And you can see that they are minimal both indoors and outdoors in winter. So it's correctly phased to support the actual observed seasonality of influenza in temperate parts of the world. So the next thing that we asked ourselves was, all right, we have some interesting findings here. And it seems to suggest that at drier humidity conditions, you're gonna get more survival of the virus, greater transmissibility of it, and that may explain what's actually going on and the epidemiological observations of increased incidence and increased mortality in the wintertime in places like New York and California. Can we use um, a model to actually simulate this? Now, before I do this, I actually want to take a little side trip here to talk about coronaviruses. So there are seven coronaviruses that actually have infected humans that we're aware of to date. Obviously, there's SARS-2, this COVID-19 causative agent that we're dealing with now. There's also SARS-1 that emerged in 2003. And there was also the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome that emerged in 2013 or 2014, one of those years. That too was a coronavirus. But we also have four other coronaviruses that are endemic, meaning that they're really consistently within the population and they're always circulating around. They go by these funny alphanumeric names, NL63, HKU1, OC43, and 229E. They tend to cause very mild illnesses, and they haven't been that studied because of that. Because they don't tend to require clinical attention, they're not medically important. People haven't invested a lot of time looking at them. But over the last five to eight years, they've gotten a little bit more attention because we have these multiplex platforms with which we can actually monitor them with which somebody who comes in who's sick at a clinic might get a nasal pharyngeal swab to see if they have flu or human metanumavirus, but they'll also test for a bunch of other viruses, including these endemic coronaviruses. So we begin to see a time series of the percent positivity for these and see how many people who are presenting with symptoms that are consistent with an acute respiratory infection actually have the endemic coronaviruses. And in doing so, we can begin to build these time series, which have come out in a variety of places. This one is from New York City's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And what it shows is for each of the coronaviruses, their circulation. Those are the ones shown in red, in yellow, in green, and in blue. The magenta shows all of them added together. And you can see that basically, these viruses are also peaking in the winter time. The black line shows you influenza. Influenza, as you see, also is peaking in the winter time. So given this, and given that we're confronted with this new pandemic agent, a lot of speculation out of the gate when this thing first emerged. Well, we got this bad coronavirus. It's particularly problematic. It's causing a pandemic. Um, is it at all seasonal? Will it disappear in the summer? Which it didn't, obviously. Uh, will it be less transmissible in the summer and more transmissible in the winter? We know that flu is sensitive to humidity conditions. And some people will talk about temperature or some people relative humidity. I'm pointing it to you to the evidence for absolute humidity. It's also uh, sensitive to UV radiation as many viruses are. Um, but we know that these endemic coronaviruses have a similar cycle as flu. We don't know why, but suppose this new coronavirus is like its brethren endemic coronaviruses 
And it too, ultimately, if it persists, which is quite possible, will have a seasonal cycle, <coughs> excuse me, where it's peaking in the winter time. And maybe that too is due to conditions such as absolute humidity. So that's what this has uh, brought forth. And there've been a, a number of studies to try to study this. A lot of them are on um, MedArchive, which is like BioArchive and Archive. It's a preprint service for uh, medical articles where they've looked at various effects. This peculiarly enough was one of the first studies where I'd seen laboratory experiments of it. And it was posted in May in a presidential news conference. Donald Trump had this up there and he was showing it. And these are conditions that were set and apparently experimented on SARS-CoV-2 and saliva droplets on surfaces and in the air from some DOD laboratory. I've yet to actually track down whether this was published, and this is the only instance of it that I'd seen. But what it showed were a couple things. Firstly, that this novel coronavirus seems to be very sensitive to sunlight. When they exposed it to sunlight, its viability dropped off. It had a half-life of two minutes or a minute and a half compared with many more minutes or hours. Secondly, um, when you look at the relative humidity and temperature conditions together, it's starting to paint a picture of survival that's actually somewhat consistent with what we see with flu that might suggest that absolute humidity modulates it, but it certainly would suggest that when community conditions are drier, such as they are indoors in the wintertime, this virus may be viable for longer, both aerosolized and perhaps and on surfaces. So I'm gonna go back to flu after this aside. I'm gonna say that given the results that we got from the laboratory experiments, can we use observed humidity conditions, absolute humidity conditions to simulate influenza? What we did is we decided we were gonna build a mathematical model to study this. And we were gonna impose inside this model a functional relationship between absolute humidity conditions and the viability or transmissibility of the pathogen. And to first do this, we decided to redo the analysis for a different measure of absolute humidity. Here we're using specific humidity, which is more readily measured and available from meteorological data. We redid the analysis and we see the same relationships where there's this strong exponential relationship between the survival of the virus on the left at one hour and the specific humidity, as well as the transmission amongst guinea pigs and the specific humidity. So we're going to have some functional relationship where the transmissibility of the virus increases exponentially as the specific humidity drops off. And this is going to modulate the basic reproductive number, R0, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about in recent weeks and months associated with COVID-19. The basic reproductive number is a measure of the average number of infections a, uh, an infected person with a particular agent would cause if you plunk them down into a fully susceptible population. So if R0 is two, that means the average person is going to infect two additional people. And you can see how that's starting to increase the numbers of people who are infected, and that would lead to growth of an or an outbreak of that pathogen. On the other hand, if it's 0.5, that means that the average person is going to infect fewer people than they themselves are, and you're going to see a diminution of the number of cases and a decrease in eventual extinction of the um, uh, extinction of the virus in that locality. All right, so we have this. Um, relationship, this functional relationship here, and we're going to build it so that it performs in a way that's similar to the exponential that you see in the left two plots, and it's going to go between some minimum and maximum values that we don't know. It's going to allow for some maximum value at a very high unobserved specific humidity, minimum value there, and a maximum value when you go down to zero specific humidity, which is also really not observed at the surface. But that's going to be the variability that we're going to allow and impose. And we're going to put this into a very simple model, a humidity forced model of influenza. This is called an SIRS model. It's a compartmental model where you take a population, say the city of Chicago, and you break everybody down in there into what their infectious disease status is. Those who are susceptible to infection, those who are currently infected, and those who have recovered. That's the progression of the disease. There's also an additional S because people can go from the recovered back to the susceptible pool due to waning immunity or immune escape and because there are multiple co-circulating strains of influenza. The Greek letters are parameters that guide the rates of transition between those compartments. We're going to have beta, which is the contact rate, as a function 
of specific humidity because beta can be expressed in terms of R naught, that basic reproductive number. So that is now embedded in there, and that's why beta varies as a function of time. It's actually a very, very simple model. It's just a two-variable nonlinear oscillator with the humidity forcing. It behaves kind of like a damp pendulum. And what we did is we we're going to run it with lots of different parameter combinations. There are four parameters in there, and we're going to assess the different parameter combinations as a fit to that excess weekly pneumonia and influenza excess mortality that I showed you in the very first slide for California and New York. However, we're going to do it for five states with different climatologies. And those states are going to be Arizona, Florida, Illinois, New York, and Washington state. So we do 5,000 simulations, each with different parameter combinations that are guiding some of the important epidemiological properties of this. Two of them are that R0 max and R0 min that guide the humidity relationship. We're going to use a state averaged daily measure of specific humidity, the one for New York is shown in the upper plot there. And we're gonna run the model with a force that as a forcing, we'll do it for those 5,000 different combinations. We'll get output that looks something like the lower plot. And then we'll see which is best fitting on average relative to the climatology of influenza experienced in each of the five states. Now, when we do this, we get something that looks like this. We have a specific humidity, uh, climatology for Arizona, Florida, Illinois, New York, and Washington state shown there. You can see the Florida is subtropical. You can see uh, the desert environment of Arizona. And on the right, you're seeing the fits. So the red dashed line is the observed pneumonia and exce excess pneumonia and influenza mortality. The blue line is the best fitting model for each of the five states. And the green lines are the second through 10th best fitting models. And you can see from this brute force approach, we were able to find parameter combinations that could match the actual seasonal cycle of influenza observed in each of the five states. But what's more important is that they converge to the same parameter combinations. So the fit that we got in Arizona and Florida, and Illinois, New York, and Washington, we're moving and using and drawing from the same parameter space. Now this is very important because the parameters are biologically meaningful. And if we had to use a very different combination of parameters to make it work in Arizona versus what made was able to work in Florida to get a fitting, we're actually calling upon a different virus. But because it converged to the same, that suggests that we have one causative agent there. Furthermore, we could take these best fitting models and we could actually run them uh, for the other 45 states that we haven't done and get good fittings of the seasonal cycles observed there using their humidity processing profiles as well. So this seems to suggest that not only can we see from laboratory experiments that we're able to actually model the survival and the transmissibility of the virus, but we can dynamically model its epidemiological manifestation and seasonal cycle in temperate regions in the United States. So the next thing we asked ourselves is, all right, that's well and good. We can model the climatology of the outbreak, but can we actually predict individual outbreaks? Could we use this and use humidity information to say about what's going to happen in the next two, four, six weeks with influenza and predict when the peak of an outbreak will occur, for instance? The answer very quickly is no. We can't simply take a humidity force model, run it and make this work. And the reason is that the flu dynamics, even as simply as they're represented in this SIRS model, this two variable nonlinear oscillator are still nonlinear. They're still irregular. And flu dynamics themselves are also nonlinear and irregular. It varies enormously from winter to winter. If you look at this plot, what this shows you is an estimate of influenza-like illness, which is a syndromic surveillance. It's another form of measuring cases rather than deaths of influenza. If we ignore the yellow line, which is the second wave of the 2009 pandemic, the other lines are showing seasonal outbreaks of flu in New York City. And you can see that they vary considerably and they're different in their duration, the timing of their peak, the magnitude of the peak, and the total area under the curve. And those nonlinear dynamics and that difference is very, very difficult to predict simply as a boundary value problem where you're using humidity forcing. However, there are other systems out there that have the same issues where the system itself is nonlinear, the dynamics are thus hard to predict, and yet they're able to make skillful predictions of what's going to happen in the future. And the best example of that is weather prediction. Weather prediction has the same suite of problems, yet we're able to make accurate predictions of what will happen in the future. So what we decided at this point is let's say, all right, let's stop thinking about this as just simply a, a climate force problem.
And let's start addressing this as an initial value problem and a dynamical system that needs to be dealt with in all its complexity using methods that allow you to make predictions for such a system. So what we decided to do was to mimic the framework for generating forecasts that's used in numerical weather prediction. And to do that, we need three basic ingredients. The first is an observationally validated model of the system. For the weather system, it's a, it's a model that describes the dynamics and the thermodynamics and the radiative processes of the atmosphere. For us, it's going to be that humidity forced uh, two variable nonlinear oscillator. As simple as it is, we're going to use that as our model because it's able to at least represent what happens on average. Maybe it's a good starting point for representing what might happen in the future if we can use it with these other measures. The second ingredient you need is you need observations. Obviously, for the weather, they get everything, they take everything they can get their hands on. They use satellites, they use ocean buoys, they use ships, they use planes, they use ground-based stations, they use balloon soundings. They use that to get information on temperature, wind speeds, uh, precipitation, pressure, all these factors that they then can ingest and feed into the models. For us, it's going to be a measure such as what you're seeing in that plot right there, some measure of the number of cases of influenza estimated during a given week, got uh, obtained in as near real time as possible. The last ingredient we need are these things called data simulation methods. They're called a lot of different things in different disciplines. Some call them sequential Monte Carlo methods. Some will call them Bayesian inference. They are types of Bayesian inference that are used to rigorously combine the first and the second. The idea is to take the model and the observations and come up with a better estimate of the truth. In effect, you're really kind of optimizing the model to behave in a fashion that's consistent with what's been observed thus far, and then you may be able to make a forecast of the future better. So just to go over this again, here are the ingredients that we're using for our fluid prediction system. Our first is going to be this humidity forced SIRS model. The second are going to be these observations of influenza that we're going to call ILI+. Plus. And what we're doing with those is we're taking syndromic surveillance, which is influ tests for influenza-like illness. And this is set up because in the United States, we have about a network of three, 4,000 clinics that report to local and state public health authorities the number of patients they see each week and what number of those presented with influenza-like illness, which is somebody presenting with a fever of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or greater and a cough or sore throat. <clears throat> if you have that, you're going to get the ILI label. It's very nonspecific. There are lots of maladies and in particular lots of respiratory viruses that can cause those conditions. So it's a syndromic surveillance. That's called ILI. We're actually then going to multiply that by the fraction of people who were tested for flu who actually turned up positive for flu. And this will wean out some of those other respiratory viruses, things as such as rhinovirus. So we're going to get a time series of ILI plus that we're going to have in just about in real time and with a six to 13 week uh, day delay, not week delay. The last ingredient, these data assimilation methods, well, these go by a lot of names. These are these recursive filtering methods that are used in lots of uh, engineering and operational design systems, and they're used in weather forecasting. They go by names like particle filtering and Kalman filtering and variational methods. We're going to use, it turns out, a version of a common filter initial, but we, we ultimately test lots and use lots of different forms of this. Now, why are we doing this? We're doing all this, and the reason why we don't just take the model and humidity conditions and run it is because if we don't do that, errors will accumulate over time in a nonlinear structure. Firstly, we know we have errors in the model structure. The model is laughably simple at some level. It assumes that everybody in the city of Los Angeles is in a room together in equal contact with one another, and we know that's not true. That's what the, such a simple model, such as an SIRS model, assumes. So there are errors in the model structure. But more importantly, there are errors in the parameters that we put in there, because those change from year to year, and we don't know what they are, because flu itself is a biological entity that is mutating and evolving, and people are behaving differently, and their prior immune response will dictate how they respond to a virus. All these social and biological factors result in changes in how transmissible a virus is from year to year, uh, how long a person stays infected, how infectious they are, et cetera. And also, we don't know what the initial state is when we're going to make it a prediction. And if we don't correct for that, if we don't try to optimize that and align that with what's actually happening, the forecast will deviate from reality very quickly for a nonlinear system. So if the black line is the true outcome, the red line might be what's model simulated, which is very off. We'll make this look more like an epidemiological curve. 
if the black is the true outbreak and the red is what your model forecasts, that's a very bad forecast. If we were to assume that those numbers on the x-axis correspond to weeks, that's really off and useless. And it's a particularly egregious forecast if you were to initiate that forecast on week 15. You've ignored six, seven weeks of uptick in activity, haven't actually incorporated that into the model, informed them of that behavior so that it has a chance to make a more appropriate forecast. So what is the name of the game? We're training the model. We're going to take the real-time observations and our data simulation methods, and we're going to use them to recursively adjust and optimize the core mathematical model. This is an inference problem. We're going to estimate the unobserved variables and parameters. Unlike for weather, where they're only estimating unobserved variables, we are also estimating our protean, biological, and social parameters. Now, if the data are rich enough for a given system, those variables and parameters should be identifiable. And by simulating the past to the present, the system then has a higher probability of forecasting the future accurately. We do this in an ensemble fashion and run an ensemble of simulations into the future, where we're taking observations on a weekly basis, using it to update the model from the past up to the present. Once we've assimilated our last observation, we develop a posterior estimate of what the conditions are and what the parameters are. We then integrate our ensemble into the future and generate a forecast to see how well it has done. When we do that and it works well, it looks something like this. So this is an example real-time forecast from the 2012-13 season generated in week 50, which is the middle of December for Salt Lake City, Utah in the United States. The black X's show observations that we had uh, at the time. And I'm getting an error message that says that my connection may be a little bad. So I'm going to try to do the following. Hold on. Let's see if I can get, well, my audio seems back. I think I'm going to do it if it will let me move. All right. So um, black X's are showing you the observations we had in hand. The blue line is the mean posterior. And that is the posterior estimate of the model simulating those observations over time. The red X's are observations we did not have in hand at time. And hold on a second. While Jeff is still um, handling technical difficulties, I would remind everyone to put your questions to Jeff in the question box. And so we can direct your questions to Jeff after his presentation is, is, is over. And seems like Jeff is offline and rejoining us. So yes, Jeff, I'm in re I just rejoined. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I apologize for that. I switched to a different um Thing, and this should be more robust. I apologize for that. Let me let me get my slides back up, and uh, I need to be given permission to share them again. Yes, I'm working on it. You should be able to share right now. All right. Can you see? Yes. Perfect. All right. Hopefully, let me make sure it allows me to advance. No, it's not allowing me to advance. Oh, wait, here we go. Okay. All right, good. Um, so let me just back up a little bit. Again, I apologize for that. So the black X's are observations we had at hand. Red X's are observations that we did not know. The blue is the posterior, which is the fit of this to the observations. And the gray lines there are uh, 150 mean trajectories for each a mean trajectory of a 200-member ensemble. Those are the forecasts that we generated. What you can see is that overall, those mean trajectories are capturing the shape of the outbreak to come, the overall attack rate, which is the area under the curve, and it's predicting that the peak will take place in five weeks when in fact it did, the third week of 2013. So overall, this is a pretty good forecast, but we would like to do a little better than just be able to say, well, we think the forecast is gonna peak in five weeks. We would like to make a calibrated forecast. We wanna be able to say the certainty with which that prediction is made. 
And this is analogous to what you hear in weather prediction. Is there a 90% chance the peak will occur in five weeks? Or is there a 20% chance? We would like to be able to ascribe the certainty of that forecast the same the way they do for precipitation forecasts the next day. And those are very meaningful. If you look at precipitation forecasts for a place, let's say, you know, Chicago, over the last 30 years where they've said there's a 40% chance of rain tomorrow, you'll find it rain on just about exactly 40% of those days. We would like that kind of calibration for our forecast because that makes for much more useful information. It's much more actionable if you say there's a 70% chance that flu is going to peak in five weeks versus a 10% chance that flu is going to peak in five weeks. Both of them say your best guess is that flu is going to peak in five weeks, but one has much more certitude about it, and you would like to use that information. So the way that we get at it actually is actually by splitting apart what these gray lines. Instead of looking at the mean trajectories, let's look at the full 200 member ensemble supporting this. When you do that, it looks a lot more like a spaghetti plot. And you can see the disagreement under the different ensemble members, the spread that they're providing, even for the posterior up to the point of forecast, week 50. And then when we make the prediction, the forecast period, that simulation into the future, there's a lot more uncertainty, but we can use that uncertainty to actually determine how reliable a forecast is in real time. When there's more spread, then we have less certitude in the actual mean prediction. And when there's greater agreement, we have more. So we're able to begin to put these expected accuracies onto the forecast themselves. So in that first season that we did this in 2012-13, we made forecasts in real time for 108 different cities. And there were a number of issues that needed to be verified. We wanted to look at the accuracy of the forecasts overall. Are they superior to just some sort of climatological expectance? Is the expected accuracy of the forecast starting to manifest? so that we can see the difference between a forecast that we say is going to be right 70% of the time versus one that we say is going to be right 20% of the time. And how far into the future can we actually make a prediction with flu or flu? So what we were able to see is a number of things. Firstly, we did much better than historical expectance, any sort of climatology. As a matter of fact, those smears and those red lines there show you what you get when you try to build something out of historical expectance. And you can make even more educated ones that dismiss options that are no longer viable as you, the weeks progress, but still this does much better. And we were able to see that uh, by you know the week 52, the end of December, 63% of the cities were being accurately forecast and 84% of them peaked at week two or later. So we were making some progression in the future. Furthermore, we began to see that those expected accuracies actually started to line up and that we were able to make forecasts that were accurate up to nine weeks into the future. The system is not nearly as nonlinear influenza that is, as the atmosphere is, so the limits of predictability extend out farther. Now, once we had done this, we realized that, well, there's a lot more work that really needs to be done. We can make a forecast, but we need to see, can we build a more reliable model? Can we test alternate model forms that have age stratified, that are stochastic versus deterministic, that use multiple strains of virus, that are spatially explicit? Can we improve the model optimization? Can we create and use and test different data simulation methods? And can we provide these forecasts for local public health use? Uh, and we use different observations. These are some of the various things that we've been working on, the same way they've been working over the last 60 years to try to improve numerical weather prediction. We've actually been disseminating them operationally on a portal that we maintain at, our, our, at Columbia University, where I'm based. And we've looked at uh, some of the things, as I said, like making more accurate models that use spatial information such as this one that was built using DOD data for 35 states. It was spatially explicit. It allowed commuting. It allowed random travel. And in using this more complicated model, which is much more uh, high dimension, uh, we were able to actually show that it was able to do a better job. The accuracy in predicting peak week and peak intensity relative to when the, an event is predicted to occur is shown in this plot here. The blue line is this spatially explicit metapopulation model. And the red line is predictions made in isolation for each of the 35 states. And you can see we're doing much better in particular for predicting the onset, which is when the uh, influenza outbreak begins to manifest, when it starts to ramp up above some background level. And you can see by having links to other areas where there may be earlier activity, you have a much greater chance of predicting when the onset will occur. We've also built systems to forecast other infectious diseases. 
This one is for West Nile virus, which is a different type of virus. This is mosquito borne. And here we use two data sources, not just influenza like illness, which is just a human measure. We actually used infection rates from mosquito pools that were captured, as well as uh, cases of West Nile virus from human hosts. And we can see that retrospectively, we're able to actually make accurate predictions of what's going to happen for humans with large leads. The problem for a system like this, however, is that in real time, these data aren't available quickly enough. As a matter of fact, for the cases of human infection with West Nile virus, there's a two to 12 week delay before you actually get reporting of it. And that makes it impossible to really make predictions in real time because that's just simply too long. We also did uh, forecasts uh, for West Africa in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone during the 2014 Ebola outbreak. And there we had to employ something that makes it, I would say, not really a forecast, but more of a projection in that this virus was so little known about it and there was so much changing on the ground and the intervention efforts were coming and going and changing all the time that it was in a very meaningful way affecting the transmissibility of the virus. And what will happen in the future thus was very dependent on what people did. So as a consequence, we would make an estimate of what we would think would happen if no change happened, and that's shown on the left. And then we would also make an estimate where we would take our latest estimate of conditions and assume that the virus became less transmissible because the virus, um, because control efforts improved. We also had another one where it degraded because control efforts fell apart. And so we would make those three scenarios, make projections and see what trajectories we had follow more closely. Now, these same model inference systems that we use to optimize a model prior to forecast are also being used to estimate these parameters I've told you about. And these parameters are very important. These are epidemiologically important parameters that tell us about the characteristics of a virus. And so we can actually put aside the projection and forecast and just use these model inference systems to try to understand what makes the disease tick and what allows it to get around, and what has happened with it. And so we've done that in th for things like Ebola, the spatial spread, as you're seeing right here in Liberia. Uh, and we've done it for things like hospital-acquired infections, like methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is a uh, antibiotic, a microbial-resistant pathogen that's problematic in hospital settings. So we're able to use a large inference, and this has millions of dimensions, it's a huge system, high dimensional system, and we're able to apply the same system, uh, types of methods adapted in different ways to try to estimate and understand the epidemiological properties of this pathogen here, a bacterium, as it moves through patient population. So this brings me now to what we've done with COVID-19. So we can take these model inference systems and really try to use them to understand a disease. And when you're confronted with a novel agent, such as SARS-CoV-2, that's really one of the first things that someone like me wants to do. We want to try to understand well, what's making this disease tick. And before I tell you about this, I got to tell you a little bit about a study that we did in New York City that was called the Virome of Manhattan. And what this study was done, it had, it had a number of aims actually, but one of them chiefly was to try to understand the overall prevalence of common respiratory viruses how much undocumented and asymptomatic infection there is by them, and how these viruses, things like flu and RSV and rhinovirus and the endemic coronaviruses, what allows them to persist in our society as they do? Because the surveillance system that I told you about, where we have these sentinel clinics that identify people who have influenza-like illness, those clinics are passive surveillance. They wait for people to come to them because they're seeking medical attention. There's nobody reaching out into the community and grabbing people and saying, I want to see whether or not you have ILI, or I want to see test you to see if you have flu. That would be active surveillance, and that just doesn't happen generally. And because of that, we don't know how many people have each of these diseases and don't bother to go see a doctor, or don't even manifest with symptoms. So one of the aims of this study was to try to understand that. And it had a number of arms. One was set up in a major tourist attraction in New York City, where we solicited people, we asked them to tell us their symptoms, for nine common cold sympt uh, symptoms over, uh, over the last 48 hours, things like runny nose, stuffy head, chills, uh, cough, sore throat, they would rate them on a Likert scale, none, mild, moderate, or severe. And we would use that uh, information to make a score of how, what their symptomology was. And we would swab them 
And what we saw is that from this is that there are a lot of people walking around in a place like New York City who are pretty much asymptomatic, but they're also shedding virus. In February, one in nine persons was shedding a common respiratory virus, and they were out and about doing touristy things in New York City. We had another arm, which is what you're looking at here, in which we enrolled 214 individuals over a nine month, 19 month period. They were from daycares and their parents, so they're three years old, 11 year old, there was high school, there were doctors and nurses who worked in emergency departments, and there were people who worked at the Columbia University Medical Center. And what we had these individuals do is we had them give us those same nine symptoms as none mild, moderate, severe every day. They would do it over their phone, it would go directly into an electronic database, it took all of 30 seconds. And they would also tell us daily if they'd taken medicine, stayed home from work or school, or gone to see a doctor because of those respiratory symptoms. And from this, we got a time series of how they felt and what they did about it. And furthermore, on a weekly basis, regardless of how they felt, we would swab them. We would take a nasal pharyngeal swab, take it back to the lab and test it for 18 different viruses. And what you're seeing here is the number of infectious episodes, which is one or more consecutive weeks where a person is shedding the same virus. And you can see how we got 32 influenza episodes and 275 HRV, which is rhinovirus, and 137 with the endemic coronaviruses. So we get all these different episodes. And you can also see that what we are also recording is the number of times people actually sought medical attention, MA, during those episodes because of their symptoms. And you can see it's not a lot of them. The next column that says probability of MA given V sub I, that's the probability of seeking medical attention given an infection with this virus. For influenza, it was 22% of the time. For the endemic coronaviruses, it's one in 25. 4% of the people who had these infections actually went to see a doctor because of the symptoms they experienced during it. So what we're seeing is that a lot of people are undocumented. We also were able to see that symptomatic versus asymptomatic is a very troublesome dividing line. Different people have different baselines of symptomology. There were people in this cohort who reported respiratory symptoms every single day of the cohort experience. I don't know if they had fibromyalgia or chronic rhinitis, or they're just a hypochondriac, but they always were reporting symptoms. And there were other individuals who never reported symptoms, no matter what they had, even if they were infected. So because symptoms are, by definition, self-reported, Asymptomatic versus symptomatic is not an easy definition, even though it seems fairly easy, asymptomatic without symptoms. It should be fairly trivial, but unfortunately that's not the case. So what we saw from this is that the natural dividing line is those who you observe, who are those who are going to seek medical attention, those are the documented, and the undocumented, which is everyone else. Now, the thing that was most interesting about this, of course, was that what happens here is, we have a lot of undocumented infection. The majority of people who are infected with all these viruses, even influenza, are not seeing doctors. And what allows these viruses to persist is that you, they are doing what you and I do when we get a common cold during the wintertime in particular. And that is nothing. If you have a little sore throat, if you have a little chill, you are still gonna go to work. You're still gonna get on public transportation you are still going to go to the grocery store. You will still keep dinner dates and restaurant appointments and theater appointments. And if you have a business trip or vacation, you will still get on the airplane. And it's doing that that takes these viruses out and about in the community and supports their silent or stealth transmission, the ability to get around. And this is why they so effectively persist in our societies, because most people who get them aren't slowed down enough that they actually take themselves out of commission and they're spreading it out there all the time. So when we saw the emergence of COVID-19, when the world became aware of this really in January, and we saw how quickly it spread within China from its epicenter in Wuhan, and then began hopping on airplanes and going to Thailand and Korea and Japan and the United States, we immediately said to ourselves, this is behaving like a common respiratory virus. This isn't doing what some of the other flus and coronaviruses that have emerged that weren't as effective in transmitting. This is getting everywhere really quickly. And it's clearly getting on airplanes, which means that people who have it are not aware that they're having it and they're unwittingly sharing it. 
So we set up a model to try to estimate what was going on. And this is a metapopulation model. This is a model that represents the transmission of this virus at 375 cities in China. And what we did is we linked these cities using Tencent travel data. This is a location-based service that is rigged into popular apps in China like QQ and WeChat that gives us estimates of travel between each of those 375 cities in the run up to the Chunyin Spring Festival. We coupled the model with data simulation methods and we used daily observations of documented infections. Those are what the cases are for the 375 cities. We did this for a very short 14 day period. We're gonna simulate from January 10th to 23rd. We start on January 10th because prior to that, there just aren't enough cases. January 23rd was the date the Chinese government imposed lockdown on Wuhan city, which quick, quickly spread to the rest of China, most of the rest of China. I mean, within a week, 800 million people were essentially under house arrest. So we wanna look at the period of time, this 14 day period, when this virus was moving about in its natural state, if you will transmitting as it will in Chinese society. We additionally have separated in this model those who are documented and those who are undocumented infections. These are separate state variables. And we also have a separate contagiousness of those who are reported infections versus those who are unreported. And our aim here is to actually estimate this. We wanna estimate the parameters in this model. And there are only six over a 14 day period. So to know whether or not the system is identifiable, we do a bunch of synthetic tests first, where we use the model in free simulation, we assign it parameters and initial states, we generate outbreaks stochastically, we take those outputs of, of documented cases, we feed it into the full model inference system and see if it can estimate or reconstitute the six parameters that we put in initially. And we do this over and over and over again to see how well it does it, if it can consistently do it, and what would make it break down so that it wasn't able to. And what we were able to find is that we could build a system that could consistently estimate this. And what you're seeing in the left are one run of this, where the truth for this particular run is the red line, and the estimates made by our 100-member ensemble of the stochastic model using the inference system for the 14-day outbreak are shown as the blue histograms. And you can see that we're always capturing it within our 95% credible intervals. So given this, we then apply this to the actual data. And the two things I want you to look at are our estimates of alpha and mu. Alpha is the reporting rate. This is what fraction of infections will be documented cases. Our estimate is 0.14. What that means is that we estimated 14% of the infections are documented, one in seven, meaning that 86% are undocumented. We also estimated for mu 0.55, which means that per person, the undocumented infections are on average about half as contagious as the documented infections. The other parameters are all there. You can aggregate them up and use them to get an estimate of the reproductive number, which is 2.38, consistent with what others were finding at the time for China during that outbreak. We can then take those parameter estimates and we can actually run the model in free simulation and see if it's capable of actually producing the features of the outbreak as it manifests. And indeed it is. It produces the daily cases at the national level for Wuhan city, for Hubei province in which Wuhan city exists. And you can see that it's even estimating the spread to multiple cities. How many cities have more than 10 cases over time? So simulation with these parameters is producing the outbreak that was observed. Because it's a model, we can also play around with it. And we said, all right, well, what if we were to shut off the transmissibility of the undocumented infections? Instead of having mu be 0.55, what if we set mu to zero? What would the outbreak look like then? How important are these undocumented infections to the persistence and transmission of this disease? And what we found is that when we set mu to zero, about 80% of the confirmed cases went away. And what this shows us is that even though they are less transmissible, they're less contagious, because there's so many more of them, the undocumented cases, the undocumented infections, excuse me, are responsible for the lion's share of transmission of this virus. And what it meant to us is that, and we did this work in late January, early February, we were done with it, that this was going to be a pandemic. This virus had three ingredients that make it very dangerous and hard to contain. Firstly, it's a novel respiratory pathogen to which 
the world has no known pre-existing immunity. So almost everybody, as far as we know, is susceptible to infection. Secondly, the majority of infections are undocumented and that these people are themselves contagious and support the silent or stealth transmission of the virus. We also, by the way, were able to see in this study, I'm not showing it here, that there's also pre-symptomatic shedding for those who do become documented cases. Lastly, even though the majority of people are undocumented when they're infected, there's still a substance enough number of people who are going to need hospitalization and ICU care and are at risk of death that this is going to have severe consequences for the planet and is going to be a very challenging outbreak and the worst pandemic we've seen since 1918. So just to put this in a little perspective, and I, I think I'll stop at this slide. As I mentioned before, there are six other coronaviruses that we know have infected humans outside SARS-2. SARS-1 was very, very deadly. It had a 10% case fatality rate, but we haven't really been able to identify very many, if any, subclinical infections. In other words, there were no undocumented infections with this disease. So everybody who got it was identified, and it appeared that people did not become contagious until their symptoms manifest. As a result, it could be circumscribed. The Middle East respiratory symptom, which is syndrome, which is more recent, also had a smaller rate of asymptomatic or undocumented infections, but also it wasn't very transmissible, which really allowed it to be circumscribed and contained so that it didn't get out of hand as this one has. Then on the other side of the spectrum, we have the seasonal coronaviruses, 229E, OC43, et cetera. These tend to produce very mild infections. And these are the other end of the spectrum that are not going to cause severe clinical complications like SARS-1 did, but are going to get around because there's so much silent and stealth transmission. This virus falls in between them. It produces both severe clinical outcomes in some people, but it is supported by the fact that the majority of people are not gonna be slowed down by it and are capable of spreading it person to person to other people unknowingly, unwittingly, and setting up new chains of transmission and some of those people who are infected are themselves going to need hospitalization. All right, I will stop there. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to entertain questions. Dr. Shaman, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we have a few questions that I'm just going to um, kind of sort through and ask you. Um, the first one, and I think this is just kind of an overarching question that probably a lot of people have, are since most coronavirus, coronaviruses disappear in the summer, why did COVID-19 not do that? Um, because in this case, immunity trumped seasonality. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that this virus comes into a population where there's no prior immunity meaning most everybody is susceptible to infection. And part of what determines the transmissibility of a virus in a population is the susceptibility of that population. So I talked about the basic reproductive number as this measure of how transmissive the virus is, right? But in fact, the thing that you really wanna keep an eye on is what's called the effective reproductive number, which in its simplest way is just the basic reproductive number multiplied by the fraction of people who are susceptible. So if you have a basic reproductive number of 2.4 and 75 percent of a population is susceptible it's going to have an effective reproductive number of 1.8 it's still greater than one and it's still going to move through that population for influenza when we had the 2009 pandemic that virus is seasonal and it was not as transmissible in summer but it's also not as transmissible as this virus in general so what happened was that we had spring outbreaks in some parts of the United States where it was introduced there. And then when it got really warm and humid, it became sufficiently less transmissible that it wasn't able to support sustained transmission in the broader community. We had little pockets in boarding schools and on military vessels, places where people are in close proximity to another. You could have little outbreaks of it, but there wasn't enough sustained transmission until the fall when conditions started to get less humid and the virus survived longer, and that jacked up the effective reproductive number above one. This virus, SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent of COVID-19, is more transmissible. So there's some modulation by environmental conditions 
but it's not enough to bring that effective reproductive number below one, not with the high level of susceptibility in the population that exists right now. So that's the reason. It in fact may have slowed down. We may have, believe it or not, caught a break in the United States in that things might have been worse if this had had wintertime conditions. And that is a concern going into winter because right now when we, I look at the balance of evidence, there's some indication that there's some seasonality of it. It's not the best, it's not airtight at this point, but I, my suspicion is there is, and that it probably is more transmissible in the wintertime. And so what we're gonna be contending with in the wintertime as we're moving into it is schools being in session, people being indoors more, the virus being more innately transmissible, a lot of factors that are gonna be favoring the transmission of this virus are gonna come into play. And so we have to be very vigilant so that we don't get another wave of outbreaks. Thank you very much. Um, another question is regarding your actual model. Um, someone would like to know what limits your spatial resolution in your model. In other words, city versus state virus incidents. Right, so in China, we did it using the city data because those were available and that's where a lot of the action was taking place. Uh, when we transferred it to the United States, we did it at county scale. And that's because we had access to county data. Uh, we can't go below that because we don't routinely have access to county scale data, sub-county scale data, excuse me. Uh, but we can run the model at, at county or state. The, the resolution depends on the questions you want to address. You know, as with any model system, you want to design it for what it is that you're trying to answer. And you want to try to specifically tailor it for that. For the United States, we worked at the county level because we could get county data and we knew that there were different policies being put in place and different levels of compliance as you move from county to county. You have really radical differences uh, between uh, what's going on with the potential in a densely populated place like Manhattan versus a more rural county in Montana. And we don't, or a rural county in New York State, let's say. So we don't wanna combine those all together. We'd like to maintain that resolution if we can. And county is the finest resolution we have. Thank you. Um, this next question has to do with also um, the model itself and wondering how complex um, it can become. So they said, in addition to absolute humidity, would the model be, would it be feasible to add other environmental parameters such as solar flux onto the droplets? Um, they said they're curious on how much you can ramp up the complexity of the model as a function of environmental variables. You can certainly ramp it up, but you know, the thing is you've got to have a robust phenomenology to actually put into it. You would want it, particularly in a forecast setting, to improve the forecast. And we've been able to show that we can run the model, the flu forecasting model, without humidity forcing, and we can run it with humidity forcing. We actually do better when we run it with humidity forcing. I would want to have that same standard, that out-of-sample real-time prediction is approved by the use of that environmental driver, right? And uh, that, that to me seems a prerequisite ne necessary condition for using it in that fashion. Otherwise, it becomes speculative. Yes, you can look for process-based effects, and that's very important for trying to understand things. But if the process is really that important, you would expect to, it to have some predictive capability. So I, I think that's, that's very critical. There's no limit to the, how complex the model can get. You know, that first model I showed you literally has six variables and parameters total, adding both the parameters and variables together. That MRSA model that I showed you of the hospital acquired infections, that has millions of degrees of freedoms. I mean, it's enormous, okay? So you can run them with different things and obviously weather prediction models are even larger. So it, it, it's the complexity really has to be supported by the data and the questions that you're trying to address. Uh, complexity for its own sake, in my mind, is not a worthy endpoint. Thank you. Um, this last question says, um, I wanted to see how much the r naught changes in influenza infection depending on the season. So knowing that it's transmitted year round, even in temperature, temperate areas, um, how much is the r naught changing? Well, well, influenza is not transmitted year-round in temperate areas. People get it sporadically, but the, the, there's no sustained transmission of influenza in the summertime. Uh, there are other things that you may get. If you get a, 
you know, there are two ways of looking at it. Yes, you can go and look and see, and you'll see some sporadic influenza taking place occasionally and appearing in communities. But if you're saying, you know, you get a really bad cold in the summertime, that's probably not influenza. As a matter of fact, that may be para-influenza, which is a different virus, and some of the types of that actually are phased to actually transmit during the summer, and they're not present in the winter. They have a different, different seasonality to them. Um, the transmissibility of the virus drops below one because of a combination of the humidity changes and the fact that we tend to burn through a lot of susceptibles in the wintertime, so the susceptibility is very low, and that results in the effective reproductive number dropping well below one. So we've been able to show that. We could show that for pandemic 2009 outbreaks, how the effective reproductive number was below one, that there was enough modulation uh, due to humidity conditions that it put it marginally below one, which was why we didn't really have much activity then, and then it really took off uh, in September and October uh, when things started to dry out. For this virus, uh, you know, our estimates are that the estimates are conflated because sorry, we're doing so much to try to control it. You have to layer when you have an effective reproductive number for SARS-CoV-2, it's not just susceptibility and changes due to some environmental factors that we really don't know as of yet, but it's also the mask wearing, the social distancing, the telecommuting, uh, teleworking, I mean, school closings, no mass gatherings, all those things are changing patterns that would normally provide opportunities for transmission of this virus and have reduced the effective reproductive number. So we make estimates of those every week. We have weekly estimates for every county in the United States as to what the reproductive number is right now. Um, and they range. I mean, some of them are down at 0.3, and there are others that occasionally climb up to two, even now, where you just see it running rampant through certain communities. Um, so it's highly variable. Okay, um, I think we have a few more minutes. There's a few more questions that have come in. Um, one of the questions is regarding asymptomatic carriers. Um, how does SARS-CoV-2 compared to other viruses I'm assuming besides the, what you've spoken of in, in influenza, um, how do asymptomatic carriers in other viruses compare to SARS-CoV-2? Well, in that same virum study that we did, we saw that by most definitions of what asymptomatic is, and as I said before, there really is no one definition, so you have to try a lot of them, um, the majority of infections for most respiratory viruses that are common and continually circulating are asymptomatic. Um, but I really don't like that term asymptomatic because it's squirrely. Some of our definitions of asymptomatic are you can have two symptoms that are mild and the other seven have to be none, you know? And that's not asymptomatic, but for some people that is because that's their baseline, right? So, and we have some that are even looser and some that are more stringent and, you know, depends where you ratchet it up. I really think that whether you see a doctor is really important. Whether you stay home is really important. Uh, those are indications that this is disrupting you from your normal routine uh, and that you're going to be documented potentially. And that that's the critical difference that I see there. Uh, so to me, this definition of asymptomatic symptomatic has been beside the point. They make a huge amount about it. It crops up every couple months of talking about COVID. And um, you know, what is the number of asymptomatics? Well, how are you defining asymptomatic? You know, it, it, it's variable, nobody does it. So we're not even saying the same thing. If you can't define your terminology clearly, which nobody can, then what are we talking about? Whereas it's very cut and dry for doc documented versus undocumented. Okay, um, someone has a question about a recent study in science um, and it was attempting to diagnose humidity sensitivities of the transmission of endemic H COVID uh, viruses. Um, they find different sensitivities for OC43 and HKU1. Could that be real? And if so, what could possibly create that? Was this the Baker et al. study or? Um, they don't the say. I think it's either Baker et al. or Kistler et al. I think it's Baker et al. Yeah. I mean, look, the study is fine, and there are somewhat different sensitivities that they may potentially find, but it is one study using one set of data. And they really were setting that up as an exemplar to say, well, what is the implications? What does this mean for SARS-CoV-2? And their conclusion is similar to what I said as well, which is that, you know, there may be some seasonality here, and you certainly see it in the endemic coronaviruses to varying degrees. 
but there is so little immunity to this virus that it's not going to go away over the summer. And we could see that. It didn't. Obviously, we had the huge outbreaks in the Sun Belt in the United States, and we could see it even beforehand by outbreaks in Manaus and Singapore and other places in the deep tropics. It's not like the humidity prevents it circulation. What the conditions like humidity ultimately do is they result in a phase locking where you're preferentially going to see activity at a certain time of year for a particular virus. For influenza, it's the winter time. For the endemic coronaviruses, it's winter time. For parainfluenza strains that I talked about, some of them are summertime. So, uh, but there seem to be phase lock there and there are processes that are driving them to be preferentially transmission and active at those times of year. Okay. Um, one last question, and I think we're pretty close to out of time. Um, this question says, can you clarify your confidence of the likelihood of an increase in the winter? You said both that we don't know enough to be sure and then listed all the things that indicated it could or should increase. You know, there is so much we don't know about this virus still that I'm just left in a state of uncertainty and I'm varyingly anxious about it. I look and I see a lot of th factors that potentially are working against us as we go into the winter. As I said, more time indoors, the virus may be more transmissible because of innate factors, school is in session, restaurants are opening in places like where I live in New York City, they're going to allow indoor dining at 25%. Uh, there's going to be in, you know, phase three or phase four reopening. Um, these things all are providing additional opportunities for transmission. And if you put enough of them in play, then you can have a resurgence, you can have another outbreak. And that's, of course, what we want to avoid. On the other hand, you know, there may be pockets where there's enough immunity. You know, there's a zip code in Queens where the, over 50% of the people have been infected already. Is that sufficient to keep it under wraps there? You know, there may be things working for us. But what I think it points to is not that I'm able to tell you this is going to happen, because I can't. Nobody can, really. But I can say... We have to remain vigilant. We have to keep an eye on this. We cannot pretend like we're done with this. And, uh, you know, you can't pretend like you're done with this, even if an amazing, safe, effective vaccine comes out, because the amount of time it will take to roll that out and deploy it, it's going to be six months before, before you, know, you know, enough people, at least six months before enough people actually have it. And that was presuming that it's really that effective. If it's more like a flu vaccine, which is only partially effective, we're only gonna get a partial benefit from it. So there's so much at play here. And we have to understand that, unfortunately, we're not gonna be clear of this thing and considering it and having it impact our day-to-day -day existence for quite some time. All right, thank you very much. We really appreciate you joining us. I'll turn it over to my colleagues to finish up the kind of close off for us. Thanks, Jen, and thanks Dr. J Shaman, and it's really great presentation. I think your last uh, answer just gave us a really good like stopping point that we want everyone to stay safe and uh, stay vigilant because this pandemic is still like going on and we want everyone to be uh, safe. And thank you all for joining us for our today's joint webinar between the global environment change and the geohealth section. And the recording will be available on AGU YouTube channel. And thanks for Antonio from AGU for supporting this um, webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Jeff. All right, thanks so much. I'm gonna sign off now. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.